my case all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States, and that's just what I did. Who knew I would meet Mr. Thurgood Marshall and his team, and we are backed up by the NWACP. On June 3rd in 1946, I never thought I would make history. In my case, me versus Commonwealth of Virginia, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in my favor because of me. We are able to sit anywhere on the bus from state to state. I have been a long life seven day Adventist and I had an eventful life after the historic day in 1944. I'm humanitarian at heart. I helped the homeless shelter in the soup kitchens and I was known to take people in my own home. Well, I retired at 67 and I set out to fulfill a long life goal. At age 68, I earned my bachelor's in communication and I'm, done, I'm not done yet. At age 76, I obtained my master's degree in urban studies and policy and planning. And in 2001, the president, yes, the president, Bill Clinton, awarded me the Presidential Citizen Medal for my courageous seated stand. Just like that little river, I've been running ever since. It's been a long, long time coming, but I know a change gonna come. Somebody keeps telling me, don't hang around. It's been a long, long time coming, but I know a change is going to come. Then I go to my brother. I said, brother, help me please. But then he winds up knocking me. Couldn't last for long, but I know with my God's help, I can carry on. It's been a long, long time coming, but I know a change.
blessed we. Good evening, good evening. I have the privilege to bring to your recognition, to bring to your mind, for those of you who do not know and may not be aware, if you have not caught on to the theme, this theme is honoring superior blacks. But even though they were black, by birth, they became Seventh-day Adventists by choice. I read to you now, Robert Shorty. Now I'm quite sure some of you may hear that name and not know who he is. But every astronaut on the Apollo 15 made very sure they knew who this black man, this Seventh Day Adventist man was. Because as they space lab took flight they were relying on this aerospace engineer technology to provide for them while they were in the outer atmosphere. When they landed on the moon, NASA was not sure how they would return. This aerospace engineer calculated, performed the specs on their machinery, to guarantee Apollo 15 will return home safely with every astronaut intact. That was Robert Shorney, a black man, a seven-day Adventist black man. Thought I would give that to you for a little information. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child Sometimes I feel Like a motherless child Sometimes I feel Like a motherless child A long way from home, a long way from home. Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone. Oh, sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone. Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone. A long way from home. A long way from home. interject this. I love the people in this church. I really do. There's so many hidden talents in this church. Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Hargrove. I thought it was a sound machine up here singing that. I didn't know. Thank you. Now, all right. Let me, let me, let me get on with, with, with my other part. Uh, I told you about Mr. Robert Schroening, the aerospace engineer. Well, his equipment, his technology helped our guys in outer space. But I have the chance to bring to you other seven-day Adventist black men who helped our guys in this space. They never got the chance to go out of space, but these guys, these black seven-day Adventists, kept America fighter pilots, America bombers safe in this atmosphere. I am talking about the Tuskegee Airmen, the legendary Tuskegee Airmen. We know that these black soldiers, these black pilots, 
were ridiculed, was put to the side. They were considered unfit to fly. But as the bombers would lose plane after plane, the white pilots began to come back and request, give us those black pilots, please. I'm tired of we losing planes. Them guys don't lose planes. They protect the bombers to go drop the bombs. And they don't leave. They bring them back home safely. So the white pilots started requesting these Tuskegee Airmen, along with the crew of the Tuskegee Airmen. Some of the names we know, General Chappie. We are familiar with his name. But I have the privilege to give you two other names that you may not have never heard, but I pray you don't forget. Martin Lacey Cook, Alfred McKenzie, these two, these two Tuskegee Airmen pilots flew mission after mission, kept the escorting the bombers, flight in, flight out, flight in, flight out. They were black pilots who by the grace of God were seven day Adventist dedicated men. Thank you again. May that information add light to you. publication of Deep River is considered to be the first time a Negro spiritual was used as source material for an art song. He became known as America's first prominent black composer. Deep River is a traditional African American spiritual that was arranged by Birdie. Like all spirituals, it is a song of hope and longing, expressing a desire for, uh, for peace and freedom, both in the present and in the afterlife. <coughs> Through these melodies, melodies, slaves held on to the hope of survival. It has been called perhaps the best known and best loved spiritual. I will attempt to sing Deep River. It's a hard song to sing, so give it, so pray for me. to cross over into calm ground. Deep river, my home is over Jordan. Deep to cross over into calm ground. Oh, don't you want to go to that gospel feast, that promised land where all is to go over into calm ground. Hi, my name is Joyce Bryant, born in Oklahoma, Oakland, California. I almost forgot where I was born at, y'all. Raised in San Francisco, I am the third of eight children. Can you imagine that? My mother was a faithful churchgoer. Them church folks loved that woman, y'all, and that woman loved them church folks. Mm. My father, a railroad chef who was never at home. Can you imagine that? 
at the age of just we old 14, I had to live with some family due to matters at home that we not gonna talk about. Did I mention I had to move to Los Angeles, away from my San Francisco penthouse. While in Los Angeles, I began to sing at clubs and quickly adapted a provocative and unruly lifestyle. I was loving that life, racking in over six figures a year, being featured in magazines and receiving all the attention. I need, I almost forgot about my past and I almost forgot who I was. Eventually, I got tired of that lifestyle, living for money, giving myself away to these nasty men, drinking to be someone I thought I was. I decided to turn back to the church. I enrolled in Oakwood College, which now is Oakwood University, and started a new chapter. Of course, this turning point became the talk of the town. A stripper gone wild. It led my story to be published on five pages in the world's top viewed African-American magazine, Ebony. The title was The New World of Joyce Bryant. The five page articles put my life and my name in a new light, a better light. I eventually became a Bible instructor and did a lot of amazing work with some amazing people. On my new path, many people tried to tempt me with my past life. One of my former booking agents tried to offer me 20, oh, excuse me, 200,000 tax-free dollars to do some provocative photo work. I told that man he better get out my face. I eventually left the church again due to some many slanders and began singing opera. I went back to singing in the places I had known before, but my old ways and styles was behind me. My talent helped to break racial barriers and brought the unity amongst the African Americans. I endured much pain, trials, and tribulations, but I never stopped singing and I never stopped going forward. I almost forgot to mention that my talent also got me in the presence of Mr. Martin Luther King Jr. His family and I would sit down at the restaurant in Atlanta, Georgia on the regular. I'm here to tell you, no matter how young, no matter how old, God is the only way, let the truth be told. I almost forgot to mention, they called me the black Marilyn Monroe. Miss <laughs> Bryant unfortunately passed away last year on November 20th at the age of 95 years old. Again, again, I hope you are enjoying this information and I hope you do your research to find out more. There's more than what we have here. So just do your research and find out how great the people are, not only from your race, but from your church. But, I, but, but, but what would black history be without us hearing from the great Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.? What would black history be just another day but I have the privilege to alert you to Mr. Vincent Hardy, a man in the background, a man with a pen and a piece of paper, a man who aided the marvelous Dr. King, who gave us speeches that gave us life, that gave us hope. But little did anybody know, the great Dr. King receive help in his speeches to put his words to life. It came from his mouth, but they came from the pens of Mr. Vincent Hardy, a black man, a seven-day Adventist that helped the great Dr. King words to come to life. Again, I hope you enjoy the knowledge.
Oh, that was so good, I forgot my spot. Mercy. You know, giving homage and, 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 and respect to the pioneers that, that came way before us, who, 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 who battled racial racism, who battled threats, who battled life endangerment who who had to forsake homelands to 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 pursue what they felt in their hearts they did it with the expectation that we would be here one day they bore the hatred 
so we can enjoy the love. They fought the crowds. They fought the hatred so we can embolish each other in the love. You know, every time we see one another, I hate to say this because I hate to remind anybody. God placed an image on us for some unknown reason. He placed an image on us that should bind us to each other. The songs used to say, if my brother is in trouble, so am I. If my sister is hurting, so am I. I want to remind you, you remember the days when a black person would die in the community and everybody in the community would come by, cut wood, sweep the yard, wash the dishes, fold the clothes, would do something to help the family in, 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 in the sadness, in the moment of the, uh, the, the moment of bereavement. What happened? What happened? Our skin did not change. The mark that God put there is still there. It should remind us constantly, you are my sister. You are my brother. I don't care if we don't bear the same names. The mark that God put on us identifies us as the people of color. Let us go forward and conduct ourselves likewise. We want to honor black history, honor black future. Honorable mentions. We talked about those who were in the science department. We talked about those who was on the battlefield. We talked about those who was in the entertainment. But allow me just for a moment to mention those men who forsake all to follow God. I'm talking about God's ministers. You know, it's one thing to be a minister in 2023, but to be a black minister in 1814, to be a black minister in 1832, to go against what the average white person would say and read from the Bible that you're not supposed to know how to read. Not only did you jeopardize your own life, you jeopardize your family lives. Just have the privilege to mention these ministers. L.L. Barr, 1805. Charles Clinton, 1814. These two pioneers were the first ordained black Seventh-day Adventist ministers in the United States of America. Did you catch the date? 1814, 1805. We couldn't sit at dinner tables. But those brothers were in pulpits preaching the word. Brother Kenny would go out into the community and get one, two, three, as many as 12 members and baptize them. El Bar had the privilege to speak in the northern part of the country. And not only what he spoke, Brother Kenny spoke so well, the legendary sister Ellen G. White came from Michigan down to St. Louis to hear this brother speak. And even though he met with opposition in the Seventh-day Adventist church because he was a black minister, Sister White went back to the general conference and schooled them all by saying, we should be supporting these colored ministers. They spread in the word of God. You know, honorable mentions, let us not forget some of the legendary people that we have the privilege to hear. We never got to hear Elder Pastor Barr. We never got to hear Pastor Kennedy. But we had the privilege the honor to hear the legendary E.E. E. Cleveland. We had the honor, the privilege to hear the legendary C.D. Brooks. We had the honor, the privilege to hear Elder Walter Pearson. Now these men have taken their rest, but their words that God came and spoke through them, their words 
still gives us life and direction to the dead. You want to honor these people? Honor one another. Thank you. she was ever born, before her parents was ever born, her future was already being laid out what she would be, what she would have to do. And not only that, her family, as I read about her family and the struggles that they went through so that when she came on the scene, all she knew was love. All she knew was compassion. She didn't see no race. She didn't see no color. She didn't see no diseases. All she seen was a child of God. And she tried to help you. She tried to save you. To, to the point where she had no children of her own. This lady lived to be 91 years old and never had a child. So let me share with you about Miss Ruth Temple. Ruth Temple was born in Nascheck, Mississippi. You know where that's at, Elder Grissett? Nash Chess, Mississippi, on November the 1st of 1892. Her mother's name was Amy, and her mother was a sophisticated lady. She was a teacher. And guess where she graduated from? Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina. But guess what? This says South Carolina, but I know Raleigh is in North Carolina. But back then, we don't know where the lines were. So the line might have been on South Carolina. But anyway, her daddy was Richard, Richard Jason Temple, and he was a Baptist. What did I say? He was a Baptist minister and a church leader. He had finished his doctoral, but he never did get to finish his dissertation. But anyway, him and Amy, they were meeting, and they had their future already planned. They, was, they knew how many kids they was going to have. Six said Richard Amos, said, I don't know about that. But anyway, that's what happened. And Richard came up with this idea to move back down to the south. Uh, Amy said, I ain't, I mean, uh, Amy said, I ain't going back down to no south. We ain't doing that. But anyway, before, way before um, Ruth was born, and this is how she got down to the south because her parents were from, they were from up north. Richard had this plan that he said God laid on him that they would move down south and that people would come into their house, all peoples, all kinds of people, all races, all creeds, all colors, all educational backgrounds. And our children would learn love before they learn hate. And that's what he planted. And so they made this move. They had 13 acres of land. How many of you got 13 acres of land? I ain't got nothing but a point five. So I just thank the Lord for that point five. Lord have mercy. They had 13 acres of land then. And they did exactly what Richard had set out to do. And Amy, she, she took care of people. She was great. 
at weaving and sewing. She would make clothes. She would do all these wonderful things for these people. And so as the story goes on to tell of her life, um, they did these things. But at the age of 10, Ruth lost her father. That was devastating for her. She's never experienced loss because she was real close to her father. She was an outdoor girl. She loved adventures and hanging out with him. And then when he lost, then when he died, that was it. And so in 1904, Amy packed up the crew and they moved all the way to South Los Angeles, California. Previously, before they got there now, these kids never been in uh, a school, a regular school. They were homeschooled. So they, even being homeschooled, they didn't interact with other people. But they still knew love, whether the interactions were there or not. These children knew love. So one day, Walter, with his bad self, he said, I'm going to make me a gun, a homemade gun. He goes out there and gets some gunpowder, and he going to stuff it into a, a hose. And he going to set a match to it. What do you think happened to poor little Walter? It blew him up. Blew his little face up, bless his heart. But it wasn't as bad because that's when Amy had her first experience with what she wanted to do when she grew up. She ran to her brother, her and her mother. And Amy, the mother, couldn't take it. She ran away from him. She left Ruth and Walter there. She running and screaming. But Ruth went into survivor mode. She took care of her brother. She took care of his wound. And come to find out, he only had a black eye. It wasn't as bad as mother perceived it to be. And then on to that, she went on to her next thing that told her, yeah, you need to be a doctor. She had a neighbor. He fell into an oil ditch, got drugged all the way down the ditch. They couldn't get him out. By the time they got to him, he was not breathing, no life in him at all. Again, Ruth went into survival mode. She started CPR. She started doing what she can, and he woke up. He, <laughs> you know how you do it, right? I've never been to that point, but anyway. Life came back into him, and she was like, oh, man, I want to be a doctor when I grow up. And so that's what she did. She went on to become a doctor, um, first black girl doctor. And so it says at that time, um, Amy mom was having some, some spiritual problems. She wanted a church. She wanted a true church, the church which she could be taught the word of God. And that is when she ran into an Adventist. An Adventist at this time, and they call, it's called Los Angeles Central Church back then. And the lady name was um, Jenny. Jenny said, we got to start reaching more African Americans. And so as they did the studies in Amy and her family, which is Ruth's mother, they were baptized into the faith. And so this is how Ruth became a seven-day Adventist. And one day, she and her sister were invited to go to this program and give a speech. And so when Ruth got up there and gave this elegant speech, oh, this man named Theodore, he said, oh, man, you're just expiring. And so he told the team that was there at the time, he said, you know what? He says, I understand that Ruth wants to be a doctor. And so they were moved and they decided to pay her full ride at that time to what they call back in 1904, the College of Medical Evangelists, what we know today as Loma Linda University. And so in 1913, she was enrolled into Loma Linda and the only black student there for most of her time. It says Dr. A.W. Truman, he was her teacher at that time, and he was teaching out of the book called The Ministry of Healing. He was teaching out of this book, and Ruth became so fascinated with the method that Ellen G. White was writing about and that Dr. Truman was teaching her about that she adopted that that um, what they call, she called it the New Start program. And so I had to go Google to figure out what the New Start program was. And it's just God's eight laws of health. Does anybody know what God's eight laws of health is? 
It's nutrition, what you put in your mouth. It's exercise, it's water, it's sunshine. So get off of those iPads and get from in front of those TVs and get outside. It's temperance, it's rest. You need to go to rest before nine o'clock. Somebody. Uh, air, and the last one is to trust in God. And Ruth took this eight God laws of health and went back to Los Angeles and she practiced it with the people there in this poor area. And she was dealing with people who were dealing with all kinds of diseases and whatever they did, it just was not working. But with that in love, she was able to reach and save a lot of people to the point to one year they had what they called the bubonic plague. They had that in South Los, Los Angeles and said once it wiped out a third of the human population in the middle of ages. Well, she applied the ABC, which is A, acquire essential basic health knowledge. That's what we teach. B, put that knowledge to practice in your life. You got to live it out. C, and share the knowledge with others. We can't keep it to ourselves. And so that's what she did. So she went into doing that. And so um, she was able to form this clinic. And with this clinic, um, excuse me, before she got the clinic, she went to um, the community, um, the government, trying to get the clinic. But before she went through that, she did some, I guess you want to call it, uh, when you try out programs. So she said she was going to try out this program. She called it the community club where she went into a nightclub and she told a nightclub because they was having some issues with venereal diseases there. And that was the problem with in Los Angeles at that time. They were just unhealthy and they didn't have the knowledge to be healthy. So in that, uh, Ruth came up with this health study club and she did it you know, she tried her little health club out with different areas, and she saw that, man, this is working. Um, she helped people overcome alcoholism, smoking, drug abuse, and being promiscuous, what you're having sex without doing the right thing. Yeah, that word. Yeah, yeah, you know. Um, so she did all these things, and it became a hit. And so she took it into the clubs. One guy... Um, really loved her program. His name was Cur Curtis Mobley. Um, she went to his nightclub and said, well, can we do this study? You know, since STD is so, it's a pandemic right now. So he said, sure, why not? So he invited her in and asked her to come up on the stage. And this is what she said. This is Ruth talking. She says, I'm a minister daughter and have not been in the habit of frequenting nightclubs and especially that group so Cur Curtis Mobley asked me to go up on stage, and then he turned the spotlight on me. Here are these people sitting around smoking, drinking. Some of them are gambling, and honestly, I was scared to death. I had been doing a great deal of public speaking and always been perfectly at ease, and the thought came to me, well, people are just people. And so with that theory in mind, she was able to help them come up with this um, health study club where people would come in and they would get tested. They would get tested there and they would get treated there, tested and treated. And so she did not only to that club, but some other clubs in the area because she was trying to reach the people. She was trying to save her people. So let's keep moving forward. 1941, Los Angeles um, City Health Department gave Ruth a full scholarship for a master's in public health from Yale University. So before she left the city of Los Angeles, she was appointed her first public health officer. And while at Yale, she studied under CEA Winslow, and he was the founder of the field of public health. So she was sitting at his feet, like we sit at the feet of Jesus, trying to get all she could while she was there so she can take it back to help save her people. And so that is what she did. She got all the knowledge she needed. She took it back to Los Angeles. And there, she was, get, she was given a lot of accolades, but she never took credit for it. And I forgot to mention you that she did marry, marry a young man named Otis. Otis Bank. She did get married. 
and um, they never had any children, and she lived at her clinic. They lived in a chicken coop. Um, they actually was living in the clinic, but because they had to put equipment and stuff in there, it pushed them out of the clinic. And so she said that her and Otis lived in the chicken coop on stilts right there in the clinic. And um, she said she loved him. She told herself, she said, um, I don't see anybody that I could live with forever. So I had this motto to, get, to not get married unless I found someone I'll be more miserable without than I could possibly be with. So she said, I've known some girls who felt that they were kind of dishonored to be an old, to be old maids. But I was proud of the fact that I was an old maid and my mother never gave us the idea that we had to get married. And so what she said about Otis was, she said that he made her feel um, like she was just miserable without him. And so that's when they got married. She just felt that she would be miserable if she did not continue on her journey without him. Um, the story does not tell us, I mean, well, this does not tell us what happened to Otis. But anyway, Ruth went on to get a lot of accolades. She was also um, commemorated for, um, from the California Governor Ronald Reagan and U.S. President John F. Kennedy at the time, London Johnson, Richard Nixon, and Jim Carter. So she was, she was um, given a lot of accolades by these men. And so with that being said, she has a health center in Los Angeles, California. I looked it up to this day, it's still there. And it was called um, Dr. Ruth Temple's Health Center. And so in 1962, she did retire. But before she did, they were still awarding her and giving her um, honors um, as far as they gave her, um, oh, sorry, this is from our general conference. Um, at the 1975 General Conference in Vienna, Australia, Ruth was publicly honored with other stellar Adventist women for her accomplishment in the field of medicine. When asked in 1978 what role the Seventh-day Adventist faith played in her life, Ruth responded, oh, it was dominant. Things because I, f uh, thing because I feel the way that God is our creator, and without him, we can't do nothing. With him, we can do anything that's right for ourselves and for others. So religion is really my life. And so with that saying, when they um, honored her, she actually had some of her babies, because she was a gynecologist, um, she had some of her babies that was in the audience that actually let her know that they was there and that she had delivered them when they were born. And so Dr. Ruth, Tem Ruth Temple, she died um, in her beloved city, uh, February the 8th of 1984. Let's give everyone another hand clap. We have to remember the dreams and remember all of our history. I'm gonna do this song, I'm gonna try my best to do it anyway. You have a choice, your heart will know. You got to look back sometime to know where to go. You have a voice, long as you live. It's never too small, whatever you got to give. When your life is low, hold on, and you want to let go, be strong, hold on. <laughs> Remember the dream we had when there was nothing else. Remember the light that shines and find it in yourself. Remember the dream is yours. So let it guide your way and keep it alive. 
with you each day. Remember the dream. Troubles of this world, troubles of this world, soon will be done with the troubles of this world. We're going home to live with God. No more. No more weeping and wailing. Amen. We have a rich history. Oh, my goodness. I have learned so much today. Anytime you go to a program and it makes you want to go home and do some studying, because that's what I'm getting ready to go do. I'm getting ready to find out about Miss Irene and all these people and that character that you had, uh, Asia. I'm getting ready to go and take it a step further and learn some more, amen? Uh, you were talking about Dr. Hardy, Vincent Hardy. We found out last week that the seamstress for Dr. King was Sister Irene Walker from right up here in, in uh, yeah, for Dr. Martin Luther King was Miss Irene Walker. Yes, we just found that out last week. Uh, my Shiro is Dr. Eva B. Dykes. She's the first Seventh-day Adventist woman who received her PhD. And uh, at Oakwood University, there are many buildings named for Dr. Dykes. Let's give our sister Sherry McCoy stand up. The Lord has blessed us today. We are blessed and enamored. Knowledge is power, and the Lord used you to take us to another level. And we thank you from the bottom of our heart. I thank you from the depths of my heart. You did a wonderful job. To God be the glory. Amen. 
You know, black history is not just in the month. Amen. Let's give a little bit more. Amen. We understand. She gets to celebrate you every week. Today, we get to celebrate her. Amen. Um, for those of you who like to study about black history like me and learn some things, um, let's not just concentrate in the month of February. Let's just take some time on Sabbath to highlight somebody, you know, and, and just lift up somebody who made a contribution. And I say to our young people in here, you guys are so talented. You have so many ancestors' shoulders that you're standing on. There's so much that you can do because somebody else has already done it and to propel you to another level. Amen? I want you to know that March 4th, what day did I say? The great James Weldon Johnson's uh, God's trombone. Uh, you might not know, but I know. God's trombone is going to be performed in Horry County. I don't have the, the name of the church. And it is an admission of, I think, $35. But by the grace of God, I plan to be front and center. Amen? Uh, so we want to remember J Dr. James Weldon Johnson's God's trombone for those of us who like that music and that era. Sister Sherry, is there anything else I've left out that you want to say I want to thank all of you that participated today and let the Lord use you and you use your talent for the glory of God. On behalf of us, to you, we thank you. Before we have our closing prayer, I'm going to let the mistress of ceremony, the lady of the hour who put this together, I laid this little task in her show. I said, uh, I listen. See, one thing I know, the talent of this church, I do. There are many talented people. And I said to her last year, Sherry, I would like for you to lead out in our black history program. And the Lord has blessed you, little lady. And I'm so proud of you. And God gets the glory. And he has used you. Great things he has done. Praise the Lord. Oh. Okay, all the information Sister Sherry said came from blackadventist.org. In fact, they have a book that's just coming out. Um, I saw it on, in the thing about black contributions of Seventh-day Adventists. But that's what made me proud. These were some Seventh-day Adventist people I didn't even know. I didn't know them. So if some of them I didn't know, I'm going home to do some research this evening. Amen? I invite you to stand as we close the Sabbath and close the day. We thank you for coming back this evening. We thank you for allowing God to illuminate your heart. We thank you for allowing God to utilize your talents. The bottom line is we are very talented people and God wants to use us even more. I always say to you, there's an African proverb that says, if you don't know who you are, then anybody can name you. And if anybody can name you, you'll answer to anything. I'm so glad today you know who you are and whose name you have and who you belong to. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we are so blessed this evening to call you our Father. We are so blessed that you utilize the talent. We thank you for the gifts that have been returned back to you this evening. We thank you for learning about our ancestors today and to learn about our church history. We thank you for all of this being put together. We thank you for the willingness of the participant. We know that only what we do for you is the only thing that's going to last. Now bless us and keep us, we do pray. Amen. May God bless you, and I hope and pray that my team wins tomorrow at the Super Bowl. To God be the glory. Amen.